Brand disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed by individuals on this platform, the callers plus invited guests are their own. The information you hear does not reflect the overall views of all parties associated with this brand. We encourage everyone to research all things heard live or via archive for edification purposes. Discretion is advised. Don't touch that dial. You're now listening to the Big Talk Free Radio. Help keep the show on the air. If you want to help, you can send me a donation to PayPal. The email is debatetalkforyou at gmail.com or through Cash App, dollar sign Sal Showtime. Thanks for your support. Greetings, greetings, much love to all, all honor and praises to the Most High, also known as the Supreme Intellect, known as Jehovah, Yahweh, or whichever you prefer to call him. The Bait Talk presents the Men of Segment, and I'm your host, Brother B.A. Yo, Sal, what's the word, I? Can you hear me? Hey, what's going on, Brother B.A.? We back, man, 2021. The Men Up Segment, what's going on with you? I'm good, my man. Just feeling good. Uh, glad to be back amongst the brothers and the sisters who are listening. And even for those who listen who listen to the show on the YouTube channel and on the archive or when it's archived after we're done. So just much love to all, and I'm glad that everybody is here. So um, you feeling good, my brother? Yeah, man. Feel great to be back on the air. You know, it's been a while. You know, but we're back it's 2021. I appreciate the family that's tuning in via phone, via Skype, via internet, all over the globe. Check it out the show. And as usual, make sure you spread the word that the Bay Talk Few was live on the air. We have a brand new number, family. That's why we have a brand new number. The number is 516-531-9959. That's 516-531-9959. You have a brand new number, so make sure you definitely spread that all over that you can call in with the new number. Put it on speed dial. Make sure you save that number up. And when you call in, press number one if you have any questions or comments. But uh, you can go ahead, B.A. Yes, sir. And this evening, I have a special guest. Um, I got the chance to know this brother the last couple of months. We got the chance to reach out. I reached out to him. He's reached out to me. We got the chance to build and have some powerful, dynamic conversations. Well, me and the brother met in the dungeon. AKA the bat chat, <laughs> but I'm going to allow um, my, this brother, I consider him an elder brother in the word. So I'm going to fall back and allow our brother to introduce himself and to give us a brief, um, run, give us a brief introduction about who he is and how long he's been in the word. Go ahead, my brother. All right. Leo Tov, Shalom to the audience uh, and to the panel. This is Pro Horizo one. I'm known as Mr. Law into the testimony. Uh, I am an avid believer in the Most High, Yahuwah Elohim. Uh, that is God to most people. I am a stringent Bible student when it comes down to what the Bible is saying, historically, grammatically, linguistically. Uh, like most, uh, I just have a passion for the word, and I've always had a passion for the word ever since I was a child. You can say I'm a believer. Uh, I'm not heavily religious, uh, but I do believe in, you know, I want to understand what the Bible is saying, where it comes from, who wrote it. Uh, Other than that, uh, I'm just an average, ordinary guy, a student of the Messiah, which is Jesus Christ to the audience. Uh, And I do have a big audience out there that's listening tonight. So I want, you know, all my people to understand what I'm saying. Clearly, I will be speaking to both sides of the, from the Hebrew audience to the Hebrew Israelites to the Christians. Uh, There's some theologians out there that I'm acquainted with. Uh, I hope that you all do uh, stay tuned and listen and pay attention closely to what I'm saying tonight. I realize that a lot of things I'm going to say is going to be, uh, really blunt, but uh, I, and I know I'm going to hear this in the back chat later, but 
But uh, for now, that's it. I want to talk about the sovereignty <laughs> of God tonight um, and what that means. And how does that relate to your life, my life, your parents' life, your friends, family, business, jobs, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, financially. I will cover a wide range of verses from the scriptures, but in just a more uh, methodical way. So that's it. That's it. Well, thank I'm, you, I'm ready to, thank uh, you, my brother. Get into it. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, my bro- thank you, my brother. Appreciate you. Before we get started, I would just like to remind everybody: the Bay Talk for You is a platform to where we allow brothers to come on and build, and and most definitely come together and put the pieces together. No foul language, no cursing, no ad homs, no personal attacks. We don't mind our brothers and sisters who are listening um, to chime in and build with us. The moment you throw a shot, I will pull the plug. No games. And with that being said, my brother, the floor is yours. All right. I appreciate it. So with anything, as I always say to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to these, it is because there's no light in them. That is the book of Isaiah 8, verse 20. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible uh, because what it does is it keeps me in line, keeps me focused on not my opinion, but rather what God is saying. Another important verse in the scripture that I like to use is St. John 17, to know him, to know God, his son, this is eternal life. I'm paraphrasing. When we bring up this subject about sovereignty, a lot comes into play. I, want, I, I don't want to hang on the word too much, but I, I, I believe that it's necessary to start with at least some definition. We have to have some definition. So here's a few things from, and, I, and I'll just pull up something from the Wikipedia here and, and from some of the other articles uh, concerning what sovereign actually means. And I want to break this down in a way where anybody can get, get this. You can look this up in a dictionary. Sovereign. Noun. A supreme ruler. Especially a monarch. A monarch is a head of state. For life or until abdic- abdication. Or the head of state. Like a king or a queen. A monarch. That's what a sovereign is. It goes a little bit further than that. Sovereign goes into the role. It goes into the independence or autonomy. It goes into arbitration. One of the most common phrases that most people probably would be aware of is the phrase free will. God is a monarch. The Most High Yah is a sovereign. He has sovereignty. Sovereignty possessing supreme or ultimate power. One of the things we find in the Bible, if you would turn to Isaiah 41 and verse 26. Here's an example of what this means to possess supreme or ultimate power when we're talking about sovereignty. One of the things is what comes from the mouth of God. Brother, would you like me to read for you? or you? Yes, that would be great. That would make things a lot easier. Aki, I appreciate like, that. Most definitely. Uh, which translation would you like? The King James? I also have a the interlinear Bible, Hebrew, Greek, and English, the big blue book? Um, either would be fine. Okay. Well, I'm going to read from the Hebrew, Greek, and Greek and um, Hebrew. And this is Isaiah 41, verse 26. And it reads, Who hath declared from the beginning that we may know and before time that we may say he is right? That's a question. Yea. No one declares yea. 
no one proclaims yet. There is no one who hears your words. Keep reading. That'll be good right there. So let's take okay. a little time, analyze something for just a moment. Who has declared from the beginning? In our Hebrew language, the word is but a sheep. But a sheep. In the Greek, it is RK. This means nativity. Nativity. Origin. Birth. Where things come into exist. This is very important. Everything that exists has a nativity. If you would, Aki Ravakasha, would you bring us to Genesis chapter 1? Let me show you what I mean. We'll come back to this verse. Genesis, Genesis 1, chapter 1. And verse 1. Yes, sir. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, and it reads, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is God in the beginning giving, bringing things into existence. Now, that word create is not the same word as our word create. The word is bara in the Hebrew. It means to form and to fashion. Would you give us verse 2? Okay, hold on verse for a second, brother. All right. It's verse 2, and it reads, And the earth being without form and empty, and darkness on... Hold on, let me read that again. And the earth being without form and empty, and darkness on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God Move gently on the face of the waters. Give us the next verse, please. Verse 3. Then God said, let light be, and there was light. Now, isn't that the same thing that Isaiah 41 at verse 26 says? Mm. Who hath declared from, from is a point of origin, from. Who hath declared from the beginning that we may know? God did. And he said, the word declare is the act. And I want to go into, I want to give a little definition before we move forward. Uh, This is a lot of ground to cover, but the word declare simply means to announce to our modern English definition, to announce. To announce the beginning of the state of a thing or the condition of a thing. There's a condition there in Genesis 2. I won't go too much into it. But let's just say what God does in verse 1 and 1 was declared from the beginning. We don't know when that is. Science says the earth is millions and billions and trillions. Nobody knows when the earth was first formed in verse 1 and or when the heavens was first formed. Formed in fashion We don't know that we, we have no clue of that The Bible does not say But what it does say In verse 2 Is there's something that God starts to say Concerning the Eretz, the earth Hope you all can see that There's a lot of doctrine behind that The point is God is saying Let there be light Let all this light in In this condition of darkness So he's declaring Where light is to shine. That is an example of supreme authority right there at verse, well, one, two, and three. Because it says God made the heavens and earth. Now, who did he ask to do that? Does the Bible say? No. God is not asking, can he get permission from someone to create or to form or to fashion a thing? Why the earth? Why the heaven? We don't even understand this in that sort of context, do we? Let's look at another one. Go back to that verse in Isaiah. I keep 41 and 26. Yes, sir. And we're talking about time. While he's looking for that, we're talking about time. We're talking about the work of God 
We're talking about what he declared, what he spoke. This is very important for the next point. When you get it out, what verse? Read it. What verse? Oh, at verse twenty-six. At verse, verse 26. twenty-six. So read twenty-six again. Yes, sir. Okay. Who has declared from the beginning that we may know, and before time, that we may say, He is right? That's the question. Yea. No one declares yea. No one proclaims yea. There is no one who hears your words. That's very important. A lot of scholars and scientists. Scientists will tell you what they think happened. The earth came out from a big explosion. You know, it's funny. Darwinism and some of these other scientific views that come into place, we argue over these things all the time. And it's going to always be an argument. Even in the philosophical circles, we'll find it. The issue is, what our Bible is telling us is that God being a monarch, this is true, and he has absolute authority from the beginning to do as he wills or to do as he wishes. Nobody knows the beginning, so nobody can instruct God on how to do or what to do. We weren't there. This is who God is as compared to who we are. This shows right away his authority, his power, his dominion, which is another part of sovereignty, posed to us as humans. As a matter of fact, there is no humans here. There's no humans. I don't see any humans there in Genesis 1. Do you? Let's look at another one. I'm going somewhere with this, so y'all bear along with me. Let's go to the book of Daniel, Aki. The book of Daniel. Chapter 4. Daniel, chapter 4. Daniel, chapter 4. Okay. Oh, yeah, I know where you're going. (laughs) All right, you know where I'm going. That's good. (laughs) What verse? uh, If you would. If you would. Now, this is one of these chapters, folks, where a lot can be stated. I want to bring you to a point where you can begin reading, but I want to give the audience a little backdrop, if that's okay. No problem, no problem. Here's here's the king of Babylon. God sets the king of Babylon to rule over. If you know anything about your history concerning Israel, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two halves. Southern Judah, most people are familiar with southern, southern Judah, and what is known as northern Israel. Somewhere in 586 B.C., or roughly B.C., the Babylonians come in and they sack southern Judah. And who's ruling? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, he gets... Long story short, he gets full of himself. He gets full of pride because God calls not only Israel, well, southern Judah, which is Benjamin, comprised of Benjamin, Levi, some of Levi and Judah. He calls them all to be subject under under the first beast, the head of gold or the lion. Even the animals, the Bible says, were subject unto Nebuchadnezzar He gets full of himself And God says Seven times is going to pass Over you You're going to eat Like the wild Beasts of the field At verse 16 Let his heart be changed From a man To A beast And and let seven times Pass over him This Is a matter This matter is by the decree of the watchers. Now it says watchers in the text, but this was a decree of God 
this is a decree of God, and the decree is a a law. It is a law. It is something that's similar to an ordinance. This is what's going to happen to you, being applied or imposed upon Nebuchadnezzar. And this is to bring him down. So, Aki, if you wouldn't mind, pick this up toward the end. Now, I just gave you what is known as cause. I'll pick this back up about cause and what a monarch is. I'll show you how this comes into play here in just a moment. Verse 33, Aki, and would you just read on down to 37? Yes, sir. Verse 33. And it reads, oh, for a second, I can put my glasses. Okay, my apologies, my apologies. Um, okay, the same hour the thing was fulfilled on Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from, man, from men, and he ate the grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of the heavens until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claw. And at the end of days, Nebuchadnezzar lifted up my eyes. I'm sorry, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me and I blessed the Most High and I praised and honored him who lives forever whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his rule from generation to generation. Verse 35. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one is able to strike his hand or say to him, what are you doing? Ain't that something? Because we got a lot of brothers with that kind of attitude Like they can check the most high And we come across some days Man At that time My reason returned to me And the glory of my kingdom My majesty And my brightness returned to me And my advisors And my nobles sought to me And I was Reestablished in my kingdom And excellent Greatness was added to me. Verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and honor the king of heaven for all his works are truth and his ways are justice and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Man, that's powerful. That is very powerful, isn't it? So what, do we, what can we conclude from this verse this, this particular part of the reason. Let's first examine why is Nebuchadnezzar out here eating grass, hair growing like eagle's feathers, nails like eagle's claws. You know what that is? That's called causality. Cause and effect. When God declares something, when he issued that decree, when he announced it, he's proclaiming a judgment in this case. That's what he did. This is what's going to happen to you, Nebuchadnezzar. God does this out of his own arbitrary will. And I'll, talk, I'll define that word arbitrary. God, for some reason, and I don't know why, what we look at in between what God is doing now, we say, well, he had his pride and God hates pride over in the book of Proverbs. God hates pride. This is one of the things God hates. I want to submit to you that the very reason why Nebuchadnezzar even had that pride from the start with is because God put it in him from the door. I want to submit that to you. How do we know that? That sounds familiar, Elder. What is pride? That sounds very familiar. What is pride? Pride, by definition, folks, is an undue sense of one's worth. That's what it is. 
Nebuchadnezzar had this thing where he felt like he achieved all this dignity and all this sub- subjection and his music from everything that God created on his own. And the Bible says, and I'll take you to a verse on that. We're going to the book of Proverbs on this one. I, uh, I'm sorry, the book of Psalms. You know, that's that's interesting that you brought up. <clears throat> Can you hear me on, Mark? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That's interesting that you me. brought that up. That was very interesting you brought that up, that how the Most High put that upon Nebuchadnezzar. And it also lines up with the, the king of Egypt or the pharaoh as well. That's right. And um, so the Most 94 High said, and 11 you know, when you get it. 94 and 11. That's right. And the Most High said that I will hearten his heart. That's exactly what he said to Moses. That's exactly Psalms what he said. Psalms 94. What verse? At verse 11. At verse 11. Verse 11. And it reads, Jehovah knows the thoughts of men, that they are vain. The thoughts of man are vain. So what are thoughts? What is vain? Here's what thought is. Thought is man's opinions. It's our opinions. Man's opinions are vain. And what is vain? What's vain about man's opinion? Every man in his own knowledge is, the Bible says, brutish. But the word is ba'ar in Hebrew. And that word is akin to our word. Put your seatbelts on, folks. Stupid. Thought. Definition. Noun. Idea or opinion produced by thinking. Think means to decide. It means to determine. We'll look all these words up. To determine. How one reckons a thing. What's one plus one? Well, I think it's two. We learned that from from mathematics. We are taught this. The difference between this and man's own thoughts is it comes from, would you pick up Jeremiah 17 at verse 9, please? Yes, sir. This thought, I'll do it one more time. The idea or opinion produced by thinking. Or occurring suddenly in the mind. Something that is produced in the mind. You said Jeremiah 17? Yep, Jeremiah 17 at verse 9. Verse here's, nine man, read. here's what God says about man's opinion. Go ahead when you get it. Yes, sir. The heart is deceitful above all hmm. things. And it is incurable. Mm. Who can know it? That's mm. the mind. The word is lev in the Hebrew, nous in the Greek. And that right there is our mind. That's that's the word they translate the heart. The mind. It's not the A order. It's the mind. God knows the thoughts of man's mind is what is it again? Deceitful in what? It's, it reads, my apologies. I, okay, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things. It is incurable. It says incurable. What's incurable about the heart is the fact that it's corrupt. Paul says in the book of Romans, he says the carnal mind is hostility. It says enmity, but it's being hostile towards God's law, God's instructions. That's what it says. When God says go left, the mind says, I ain't going left. I'm going right. God says sit down and go to sleep. He says, nope, I'm staying up all night. I'm clubbing all night. He says, don't eat pork. I eat pork, (laughs) you know, et cetera, and so forth and so on. That's man's thought. They're vain. That is pride. That's what that is. 
man's mind is full of hot air. In fact, that's the very meaning of pride. That's the very meaning. That's man's thoughts. Man is incapable of thinking the way God thinks. And we disagree with that, even though our Bible says so. He says that my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. That's in Isaiah 55, verse 8. Would you pick that up for us? You let your fingers do the walking tonight, Art. Right? We, we got a lot of verses. It's all good. It's all we got good. a lot of verses. got a lot of ground to cover. Isaiah 55, that's a classic. I know this one. <laughs> that's definitely a classic. Verse 8. Yes, sir. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Mm-hmm. Nor are your ways Hold on, go ahead mm-hmm. Keep going Or he also said i read it from the top again For my thoughts are not your thoughts Nor are your ways My ways, says Jehovah Or Yahweh One thing about thoughts We can find this in the book of Genesis About man's thought God is making a clear distinction between his thoughts and our thoughts. And I keep, I'm I'm hanging on this for a reason because as again, we're talking about God and his sovereignty. And I am talking about how God created the heart. He didn't ask us. Now God created man, created man in such a way there is, we can't think like him He doesn't think like us, but he made us from the beginning. That's what Nebuchadnezzar says when he says, he doeth his will, his purposes in the armies of heaven, wherever God abode is, and and in the kingdom of men, none can say, stop that, don't do that, like as we would do a child, "Don't, don't put your hand on that, don't do that. None can stay his hand or say unto him, what are you doing? Don't do that. That's sovereign. Then he turns around. (laughs) He makes an example of Nebuchadnezzar. You're going to eat grass. Nebuchadnezzar eats grass. So, folks, if you run out of food, grass might not kill you. Well, of course, these days it might. might. (laughs) You don't know what they're putting in this pesticide, but this is what God causes to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. Then he says, "Men's thoughts are vain." That's what he said. Just full of pride. One of the one of the main things about thought deals with imagination. God has a lot to say about man's imagination in Genesis. What God devises, the decree was what God devised to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. Purpose and God's work, we can see his purpose and we can see his works right there in Genesis 1. God, he, by him being a monarch, by him being an absolute ruler, he has all power. All authority To manipulate The mind Isn't that what we just read I mean What drove Nebuchadnezzar out there to eat grass It was what God declared Wasn't it That's God's authority Do you see that out Just because he did it That's God's power And by the way For the audience That's what sham means Name that's God's name right there. We're looking at it. As soon as he spoke, his word is his law, and it cannot be broken. When he said, let there be light, I can see the sun saying, no, I, not today. I don't feel like shining. My battery's weak. No, it just happened. What science says, mm. Big Bang. See what I mean? Let's take a look at another mm. verse. Another situation in the scriptures about the imagination. Of course, we need to cover that, too. I did tell I was going to define a few words. 
about man's imagination. Would you take us over to Genesis 6? Read that one, and then I've got another one for you when you're done with that one. And while you're looking yes, at sir. that, let me cover a few words about cause, okay? Now, this is from yep. the standard, uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. See if I can uh, pull up some, a little something here. I don't want to get it too, I think I want to just keep it simple. About cause and effect. Cause and effect is the principle of causality, establishing one event or action as a direct result of another. We can see in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, and I'll stop there, and we'll use the, we'll parallel it with Genesis one. When God spoke, as soon as He spoke, something began to take place. Something took shape. We have the cause. Okay, so let's put this in another perspective with Nebuchadnezzar. How did Nebuchadnezzar become king? In the law, we find that God said, I will send my four sore judgments to Israel when they go off into their apostasy. I'll punish you seven times for your sin. His four sore judgments was the sword. I have your enemies pursue you one way. You'll flee a few other ways. Pestilence, what he sent upon Egypt in the Old Testament, for, your, for those who are familiar with your Old Testament about the Testament and the judgment upon Pharaoh during Moses' time. And I'll send the sword, pestilence, the famine. I'll send the locusts, they'll eat up your crops. I'll send lice, frogs. I'll turn your waters to blood. I'll stop it from raining. Finally, I'll send the beast. That's Nebuchadnezzar. I'll send Nebuchadnezzar on you, southern Judah. Cause God had a purpose. Cause. The reason. So he's the cause of this. But he's the cause for why the earth even exists from the start with, isn't he? See, none of this could happen without God first declaring it. As Isaiah stated, this is what I mean by sovereign. Everything that happens with Nebuchadnezzar is happening because of Genesis, but Genesis is happening because God is sovereign. That's going to be the whole theme for tonight. <laughs> you might get a little tired of me saying it, but I'm going to say it. He has absolute rule. And so Nebuchadnezzar's out here and he learns, this Gentile king, he learns the will of of God He learns it He learns about the God of Israel If you read Daniel You heard the story about Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego Right Nebuchadnezzar was, he was into idolatry Nothing spectacular about Nebuchadnezzar Because he was a heathen But he learned about the will of God And it's funny Later on just on a side note God made a covenant with the beasts of the field but we'll have to get into that in another show. So he raises Nebuchadnezzar up to rule over the world at the time. He was now this beast is the world ruling system. I, I have to keep reminding brothers the mark of the beast isn't something that's new, something very ancient. God raises him up to rule over his own people. Then he humbles him, bring him down, and seven times passes over him. Some probably would argue and say seven years. Either, in either way, he learns to humble himself. But he don't humble himself. God humbles him. One thing about the sovereignty of God in our lives as believers, on a side note, if you are a believer out there, God will break you down and you'll eat grass too until you learn the will of God. Obey. Not to think, even the scriptures tell you a man ought not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think like Nebuchadnezzar because God hates pride. That's one of the things he hates. Speaking of which, why does pride exist? It's okay for God to speak proudly 
But it's not okay if we speak proudly. We don't have his authority, do we? We don't. God can brag and boast all he wants. When we do it, it's sin. Now, you can explain that to me. I'll be all, I'll give you my phone number. You can call me. (laughs) Why does God have the ability to create something that he hates? exactly what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. I would invite you all to read that story and take a close look at it. But that's cause and effect. Everything that's happening in these stories, even with Genesis, if you're trying to parallel the two, what's the common cause of it all? What's, what's the reason why any of this stuff is happening at all in time? Why? What, what's, what, are we, what are we to say? What's the conclusion of it? So if God didn't say it from the door, none of this would exist. It's amazing. And cause and effect is is a concept all over the world in history. I won't go off too deep into it, uh, but this is, they call it karma in Buddhism. Karma. And Hinduism. That's what they call it. Karma. Uh, But that's enough of that. Let's move on to another example of cause. Did we get, oh, yeah, you got Genesis 6 and 5, don't you? Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead, give it to me. Verse 5. And Jehovah saw that the evil of man was great on the earth, and every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil all the day long. Mm. The thing about imagination, and my studies, is, is, I don't know, it's been a while, 20 years. What have I concluded from the meaning of imagination is this? The brain, the carnal mind does not need to see, hear, touch, taste. He doesn't need the external senses. He doesn't need external stimuli to concoct a thing. You don't need anything from TV to invent something in your imagination. That's what it is. It is like a, it's some sort of mechanism we have, and I'm saying mechanism for lack of better terms. It's something that man has in him. This just, I think the closest thing I can compare it to would be magic. Magic don't exist. <laughs> but we think it do, you see? But like magic in the Disney and all these other movies, so some genie giving you, granting you some power to just bring something into existence that don't exist. And in our mind, one of those examples, if you would, I keep one more verse, Genesis 8. In 21, 8 and 21, while I discuss this. Anybody ever seen pink oh, flying elephants? Stuff don't exist. Freddy Krueger, something come along in your dreams, you know. Jason, these things are man's imagination. And I also believe, I, I will say this too, I don't believe in demons. I believe demons are some, something that man imagined. There's no such thing. I believe that. The average of people, you ask them, have you ever seen a demon? Most people give you roundabout, round the ring around the posy answers. And they they might look like a devil with a pitchfork and horns on his head with a tail sticking out of his back on goat legs. That's man's imagination. Yeah, I know what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. But that's man's imagination. Why do I know that? It's because... Anything a man can invent without actually seeing it, feeling it, touching it, hearing it. We just read about it. We heard about it. We don't really know it for ourselves personally. We don't have the intimate experience with it. We have subjective experiences. We have things that we cannot prove. I think Stevie Wonder had a song like that. Believing in things we don't understand 
That's man's imagination. Something we contrive in the mind without actually seeing, touching, hearing, feeling. We don't have any tangible proof for anything. That's our man. That is a vivid imagination. Go ahead and read that verse for me, Aki. Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. And it reads, And then Jehovah smelled the delightful odor. And Jehovah said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for the sake of man, because the imagination of the heart of man is evil from his youth. Yea, mm. I will not I will not again smite every living thing as I have done. Man. From his Use. That's a big statement. Yet said in the Hebrew, what we do, form, we form, meaning we give a shape to something. The human mind is really a fascinating thing. We form it like one would form pottery. Or form a house. Or if you're on the beach, you you may form a figure of a dolphin or a human. Most of the time, our imagination puts us in a place where we can just, you know, and people say this all the time, just use your imagination. Can you just imagine what it's like that all of a sudden it starts raining billions of dollars just for you and people walking in? The Bible speaks to this about a man's process of thinking. And that right there is evil. I don't know why it's evil. God says it's evil. I don't know why it's evil. I don't know if there's a good imagination. I just know that the majority of the time when God talks about man's imagination, it's evil from his youth. And it makes sense. If something starts off evil, well, you can't get evil from good, can you? You can't get good from evil, can you? You can't bring sweet water from a bitter spring. If the source is evil, and give me Isaiah 45, verse 7, if you don't mind, Aki. I want to show you something about this while I'm talking about this because it segues, segues right into it. If the, mind, if the mind of the man, is the, if the heart is evil and just really wicked above all things in some translation, Incurable is another one. That word actually means what the Calvinists would call total depravity, meaning man is incapable of doing anything outside of what God formed and fashioned. That, that, definitely, that definitely shows some authority, doesn't it? I've got a few words to talk about on that, too. When you get it, I'll read it. Isaiah 45, verse 7, and it reads, okay, forming light and creating darkness, making peace and creating evil. I, Jehovah, do all these things. Like you said, he, I. It's a hard topic for a lot of people. That's that's, very hard. That's rough. That's rough. You know why? Because people don't believe that a good God, a good, wholesome, ever-loving, everlasting God would do anything like that. If you would, give me Genesis chapter 2 while we're talking about this. So he says, I want the tree of the verse 14, 15, or 16, I think, is somewhere in that general neighborhood. He says, I form and fashion tov, good, I word evil. Now, some people like to <clears throat> they like to back and forth over this word where it says evil. They like to say calamity. I, uh, the only thing I want to ask you is if you want to wrestle for this word calamity, I want to ask you, is calamity good or evil? That's all I want to know. The Hebrew word raw, the majority, I think it's somewhere about 600 and sometimes 800 some odd times, somewhere like that. I'm not looking. I'm not counting. That word is translated to the word evil, to our English word evil. Evil 
being an adjective is describing something. It describes nouns. It, it describes things, events. And good is an adjective, wholesome. There's a lot of good words there with the word good, useful, holy. I mean, we can go on and on and all day with what's good and what's evil. Well, God has to be, if he is sovereign, I want to I wanna submit this to, to my anti-Calvinist crowd. If, then, if God is a monarch, He's not like the queen of England or the king of Scotland and Wales and all of this. No, he's the monarch of existence. I didn't say that earlier. You understand that? Let me, let me go a, a little bit further. Meaning, there wouldn't be a sun in the sky if he hadn't declared it. You understand that? If you're five foot six, the reason why you're five foot six is because God declared it. When you get that verse, go ahead and read it, and I'll pick back up on this out. Genesis chapter 2. Now, you just specify a verse. You said either 15 or 16. So, yeah, it's um, somewhere down there where God started talking about the trees. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, it's, it's, we'll there. go to verse 15. We'll just start there. And it reads, And Jehovah's God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden, to work and to keep it. And Jehovah God commanded the man saying, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. We've got two trees in the garden, don't we? Yes, sir. Two specific trees God points at. Notice when he says, let there, light, let there be light, let there be light in Genesis. He's pointing at something, isn't it? It's like uh, somebody's moving, moving in, you're moving into a new house and you've got this couch and you say, I'll put it there, right there. No, not that bedroom, the back bedroom. Point. He's pointing at something, isn't he? So these two trees, he points at them. He points at a tree of life, and he points at the tree of toad and raw. Now, I don't know what banana tree you ever ran across, a pineapple or apple tree. Most people say That's, that means apple tree. <laughs> I don't know why that means apple tree. It's knowledge, gnosis, knowledge of what is consistent in this knowledge, toad and raw. Good and evil. I mean, bleach is good for cleaning socks, brightening up white shirts. But if you drink it, that's evil. You understand? This whole world is full with these sort of things. It just has to disseminate between the two. Now, I, I will submit this. These are not little trees at all. There's no such thing. We don't. We don't. We can't go walk into a pharmacy and say, "Yeah, uh, I need an apple tree. Uh, I need some orange seeds, rather, and some apple seeds, and yeah, and let me get some tove and raw seeds too." It's just gonna look at you like you're crazy. Farmers don't plant that. That is a symbolic thing. This is sim- this is the use of symbolism, folks, isn't it? A lot of people don't realize that if they just take a little time and look at the word of preposition. It's denoting something. Possession. An exact location, an exact time, or a fixed position. God fixes something in that garden. He points to Adam. He says, look here, you see this? Don't touch this tree. For the day, would you read that part again? For the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, would you read that for us, Aki? Yes, sir. And it reads, verse 17, but Mm -hmm. of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat, for for in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Let's examine something here. I said that tree was symbolic of something. 
hadn't submitted to what yet. But let's just, as it reads, right? He says, this tree is forbidden. Something that is forbidden, now that don't mean you cannot touch. It doesn't mean you cannot eat. It doesn't mean any of that. It means this is wrong. I've determined that this tree is bad for you. And then the tree of life, he says that is he says that in the next next verse, in the next chapter over. Would you turn to chapter three about a sheet? I want to pick up the conversation just to make this stick here. Well, Again, verse. I want to be clear when I say this here. Uh, hold it at verse one. All right. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. Just hold it for me just for a moment. Let me make this tie back into what I stated earlier about evil, yes. tov and wrong. Yes, sir. In the first chapter of Genesis, God says everything that he said he saw, he said it was tov, tov. It was good and very good. The works that God did was good. See, that's God declaring what's good. He causes a tree to come up in the garden that's good, but it's evil too. Let's change the word to corrupt. Wicked. Bad. And bad is, in our English language, definition is evil. No matter how you chop it, the point is, God, as in, as what Aki read in Isaiah 45, 7, he forms tov and wrong, good and evil, light and darkness. It was dark in the beginning, wasn't it? God determines what's light and what's darkness, and he determines what's corrupt, wicked, or evil. He also determines calamity. Calamity is an event. Let's pick up what Eve said in the third chapter. To Satan. Verse 1. Whenever you get reads. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. And the serpent was cunning above every animal of the field which Jehovah God had made. And he said to the woman, Is it true that God has said, Ye shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit. Of the trees of the garden But of the fruit of the tree Which is in the middle of the garden God has said You shall not eat of it Nor shall ye touch it Lest you Or lest ye die Okay So Eve just qualified What was stated in the first Second chapter didn't she She's qualifying what I stated God said Here's his decree. There's that word again. Here's what God announced. This is God's authority. I mean, if a man comes to you in your job and says, look, I want 100 boxes packed today. Pack more. I need just 100. That person, we'd call them a super, wouldn't they? Super supervisor. They have authority. They tell you how much, how many, when, how not to, where. They don't have to tell you why. They can give you a result, but they have the authority. God announces to him, to Adam in the second chapter, he says, this tree is forbidden. That's what Eve is saying. Don't eat it, don't touch it, at least she die. God is already declaring something. Would you pick up, hold your, well, you can go back to it. Isaiah forty uh I'm sorry, Isaiah forty six verse ten. We'll go back to that in a minute. Isaiah forty six verse ten. Oh yeah. God is announcing. Favorite. Yeah, that's a good one, isn't it? He's announcing yeah. and Eve just follows suit. He's announcing what the end of 
the end of announcing the end of and I'm going to put this in quotes the end of him eating that which God has declared to be forbidden did y'all get that when you get it I'll read it yes sir verse 9 remember former things from forever for I am God and no one else is God even none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from the past those things which were not done saying my purpose shall rise and I will do all my desire okay so I am the judge I determine (laughs) that's what he said when he says he's God God is Elohim in the Hebrew And that's The In a linear translation Declaring the end from the beginning He declares the end From where The start From the nativity Did y'all get that He declares The end The end is the completion, the word is telos, T E L O S, telos, the completion, the result. Is the that the Greek word? Telos, yeah, we can look it up. We go to it. I, actually, I'll bring, us to, I'll bring us right back to it. As a matter of fact, I'll do it now. Because I'm familiar with the Hebrew <laughs> word. I think the Hebrew word is a karet. Mm-hmm. And it means this, gold. Right. To our English language, yes. This, mm-hmm. There's a few words about that. Um, ketz is another one. In the Hebrew, ketz, telos in the Greek, to be sevened. Maturity. This also deals with fulfill, establish. These are all English words that relate back to end. And depending on the context, uh, these things can be. There's a lot of latitude with it. Let's just say that. How about time? The, The fullness of time. God determines. The time. God determines when something matures. God determines the result of a thing. God determines when something is seventh. When something becomes mature, when something is fulfilled, when something is established, God determines time. Time is the forward motion of events. God doesn't exist in time. God is the cause of time. See that? Cause. Then you have the effect. God tells Adam, God tells he already determined to Adam what was good, what was evil. He told him what was forbidden, what was going to be breaking his law. Then he tells them the result, what's going to happen. We call that prophecy, don't we? Mashal. We, we call it prophecy. Prophecy is the very thing that God determines. Let's talk about determine a little bit. Just a little bit to help out with this conversation, just a little bit. And this is from the Oxford Dictionary. And there's some verb forms there, but determine. T 
to discover the facts about something, to calculate something in its exactness, to be, to calculate exactly. You go to the store, something costs 98 cents. You're supposed to get two cents back from a dollar exactly. That is something that has already been determined. But in this conversation, we're talking about God's sovereignty, not merely math, but even math is under God's determination. Let's look a little more into this. I'll read it one more time. To discover the facts about something, to calculate something, exactly. To make something happen in a particular way or be of a particular type. When you look at Genesis 1, God creates everything exactly after its kind. There's a kind in Genesis. What kind of punishment would Adam get? What kind of tree am I going to put in this garden? What kind of law am I going to give him? When we read this, we don't see that. It's not written that way. But rather, when you extrapolate out, you'll see that, hey, God already said what was going to happen to Adam before he ever done it. I would like to submit to you all tonight, God caused Adam to eat of the tree of good and evil. This is not a surprise to God, but it most likely, I can assure you, it is a surprise to most of us. Would you read Isaiah 45 and 7 one more time for us? I'm sorry, not Isaiah 45 and 7. Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46. Isaiah. Verse 9 and 10. The last one you read. Yeah, the last one you read. Verse 10. Okay, verse 10. Let me see. Okay. Yeah, pick it up. Verse 9 and give us 10, too. Give us 9 and 10, too. Yes, sir. Verse 9, remember, mm-hmm. remember, remember former things from forever. For I am God, or Elohim, and no one mm-hmm. else is God, even none like me, declaring mm-hmm. the end from the beginning, or the goal from the beginning, and from the past, those things which were not done, saying, My purpose shall rise. And I will do all my desire. Mm. Keep reading, Ock. Let's do it. Verse 11. Mm -hmm. Calling a bird of prey from the sunrise, the man of my counsel from a far off land. Yes, I have spoken. Yes, I will cause it to come. I have formed. Yes, I will do it. Listen to me. Mighty ones of heart who are far from righteousness, I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not wait. Ain't that something? I will place (laughs) salvation in Zion, my glory for Israel. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. You said he will do it. Not none of us. He will do it. And what's so strong about this verse is that God has announced that Adam would fall. Mm. Not only did he announce that he would fall, he determined how he would fall. How is an adverb? It modifies other nouns adverbs and things like that. And that means in what way? By what manner? Determined the events in the garden, didn't he? He announced it. He didn't say, Adam, don't choose don't choose to not eat. 
That's not what he said. He says, Adam, this tree of knowledge of good and evil is forbidden. It's declared unlawful to you. That's unlawful. He says, when you eat, when you eat, when you eat. How do we know it's when? Isn't when a time stamp? That's why he wound up saying that day, the day you eat. When he said the day, the day you eat. You've got to slow down. The day you eat. We don't talk this way today. It's almost like caveman talk. Me, hungry. Me, drink. <laughs> if you read it more like that, then you'll get it, you know. The day, that's 24-hour period, isn't it? The day, you, personal pronoun, Adam, eat. Adam will partake in the day and he'll die. That's what our Bible said. We'll go to that verse. I want to show you what I mean by that. This is the book of Hebrews. If you wouldn't mind, Aki. I want to take you over to the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 9 at verse 27. Hebrews 9 at verse 27. The funny thing about this... And the funny thing about this is <clears throat> verse nine, Hebrews 9 and 27. I'm there. Let me know when you're ready. Go ahead and get it when you read it. Verse 27. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once, and after that, the judgment. Keep reading. Wow. No, that's good. Appointed. A time decided beforehand. That's what that means to any English dictionary. A time. A time appointed beforehand. Before it ever happens. God has already determined, has already appointed, has already declared a event. Pointed to man to leave this earth. Let us get the book of Ecclesiastes. Let's go over there. Let's get another verse. I'm going to say that's Ecclesiastes 4. At verse 3. Let's see. Uh, I'm sorry, verse, chapter 9, verse 3. Chapter 9, verse 3. Ecclesiastes. So far, we can see God appoints a time for man. That is an event. Time and event is almost merely symbolic. In the way they're being used. Because events with time. So I rebuff. Go ahead, Aki. And it reads, This is an evil amongst all things that are mm, just it's under what? the sun. An Did evil, you say evil among all things. Evil? Yeah. Raw? Oh my goodness, what is that are done under the sun. That there is mm. no I'm sorry. That there is one event to all. Yea, also the heart of the, yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil and madness is their yeah. heart throughout their lives. And after that they go to the dead. Now <laughs> who's responsible for that? I wonder. That's a hard that's a mean, hard topic. It's a hard question. <laughs> wow. Um 
talking to, uh, well, all week. I look back at my life. I started listening to other people talk, you know, the bad chats and, you know, some of my clients. And, and, you know, all the events that's going on, you know, COVID, of course, that's always one of the big topics. You know, all of a sudden, we can't go to the football game anymore. Why? All of a sudden, thousands of people are dying. Why? Where do they go? Who is the cause of this death? Who is the cause of all of this, these events? Can't go to the football games. Try to go to a funeral. It didn't matter if a million people knew you. Uh, Maybe only 100 are going to see the guy or woman. It took you 15 hours to get to Waco, Texas, for some reason or another. It only took you four to get back. And then you look at the time it took for you to travel there, and every event you went through, it sucked. (laughs) This is the story I'm getting at. Beautiful on the way back, though. The book of Job, I you wouldn't mind the book of Job. I want to show you all something about this. And in that verse, and I'll, and I'll give you the citation here. The book of Job. I want to say it's the second chapter of Job is really what I want to say. Let me look this up right quick. Job chapter 2. Job, this this is one of these events when we talk about God being sovereign. Matter of fact, why don't you take us to the book of Job chapter 1. Job I want to show you one. what I mean about I want to show you you all what sovereignty means in, light, in lieu of what we just read about death. About one event an event in life is either going to be good or evil. It's going to be great. I had a wonderful time. Or it's going to be, man, that was suck. That was evil. That was, you know, 9-11, wars, tsunamis. You understand? Somebody came down with the flu and died. This is exactly what Ecclesiastes is referring to. See, I don't believe it just happened because it just happened and oh well. No, I don't believe that. If we look at this man in Atlanta, ooh, Job, he said some interesting things, some very hard things here. I want to show you this. If you would, uh, pick us up. <clears throat> Let's talk about that. Job 1 and 1. Let's get a few verses. You don't mind. Yes, sir. Verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz. His name was Job. And this man was perfect and upright and fearing God and turning away from evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. And his possessions were 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 asses, and a very great household, so that this man was greater than all the sons of the East. Mm. Four. And his son, you want me to keep reading or uh, just keep going? Oh, yeah, keep reading. Keep reading. Yeah, verse four. And his sons feasted. In the house of each one on his day And they sent and called their three sisters To eat and drink with them And it happened When the day of feasting had gone around Job was sent and sanctified them And he would rise early in the morning And offer burnt sacrifices According to all their number For Job said It may be that my sons have sinned and curse God in their hearts. This Job always did. Mm. I want you to stop right there for just a minute. I notice this mm-hmm. man has great possession. Hold your finger right there and give us the book of John. 
three at verse twenty seven, I'll keep if you don't mind. We're gonna go right back to it. Okay, He's got John three, three, possessions. Seven, That's what this man had. Possessions. I want to know something, first of all, because the Bible doesn't say. I want to know something. How did this man get so many sheep and cops and this and that? How, how, where did he get it from? Was he a businessman? Did he have stock in Apple software? I mean, what, how, how did this happen? We're not talking about a modern world. We're not talking about a world with technology. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an agricultural world. It's very primitive in a sense of speaking. They don't have TV, cell phones, VCR, CDs, CD-ROMs, iPhones. They don't have none of this stuff. How do they live? Most of the people recorded living in, oh, I don't know, tents, booths, you know. You know that's, that's, they didn't have brick houses and mansions and stuff. They didn't have that. They had livestock, things that would sustain your life. They had the basics, food, shelter. They lived off their animals, you know, like the sheepskins. They had their wool. They did a lot of things by hand, and they grew crops. And if you had 7,000 sheep, you got a lot of clothes. <laughs> you, you could probably open up a Walmart and sell a lot of jackets, boots and shoes and coats and hats. Just trying to paint the picture here. Job had enough to sustain everybody in his household, including his children. That's I, that's what a lot of men want to do today, don't they? I mean, we're not too far off from where they were. Most most people are not. So how did he get all these things, these possessions? How did he get it? When you get it, I'll read it for us. John chapter three. Verse 27, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. John answered, no one can receive anything except what has been given from heaven. It has to be given from above, from heaven, from God. That's how he got all these things. See that? Skip on down, Aki, in the, in the book. And I want, let's get down to a point. Where Satan says, verse 9, verse 9. I want to show you all this. I, some of you all read this story before, but we're talking about God and his sovereignty in a way where I know a lot of people don't either want to talk on it or speak on it. But yet, it's right there in front of our face. Verse 9, Job chapter 1. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, brother. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. No, you good? Go ahead. Verse- My bad. So I'll get it. Verse 9, and Satan answered Jehovah and says, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you mm. not made a hedge for him and his house? And for all that is in, I mean, I'm sorry, and for all that is his all around, you have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. Verse 11. Hold it right there for a minute. Let's analyze. There's a hedge about Job. Job fears God. God bless Job. God gave Job everything he had. He protected all he gave Job. He was fruitful in the land. He increased. (laughs) Now, I don't know. It don't seem like God hates Job. (laughs) <laughs> it doesn't I mean that's what you would do for somebody who's your friend Or family You know like a son Or servant That's what he does Job knew God The creator The sovereign The monarch Of reality Reality is true folks This is who Job knew Think about the Greatness of that state To be in a position Like this man To know the person who stood up And said I will do My will To wherever Whenever however To or to whomever I will 
This is who we're talking about. This is who Job feared. Everything that Job had came from the one Job feared, the sovereign ruler of reality. Keep reading on, verse 12. I'm sorry, my phone was muted. Verse 12, and it reads, And Jehovah said to Satan, Behold, all that is his is in your hand. Only do not lay your hand on him. And Satan, went out, from the, yep, and Satan went out from the face of Jehovah. Yeah. All that is his, I'm giving you power over it. Hold your place right there, Aki. Let's get Genesis chapter 1. We'll come back to that because we're not done with that. I want to show you something. Here's an interesting term. The word is dominion. Dominion. This is Job's dominion. This was Job's dominion. When it talks about that hedge around about him, that was his domain. We call it domain these days. Domain place where you exercise authority. Domain. Let's get a little bit out of that. Dominion. Genesis 1, verse 26. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them, them, rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over all the creepers creeping on the earth. In the Hebrew, the word is rada. To rule. To rule. And when one is ruling, one sets the limits. They set the boundary. By the way, that's the same. When you, one sets limits and set boundaries, that's the same thing as a heretic. Heretic. God's a heretic. He sets the bounds. I'll cover a little bit more about that. The boundary for Job was already set, and everything, the limit of what Job had was given to God. See, it numbers 7,000 sheep. That's an exact number in the Hebrew. Seven has an exact meaning. Again, seven, or completion, or point of maturity. Let's go back to Job. For God gives man, he gives that dog. Dominion. And what does Adam do? He names the animals. Again, name in Hebrew is Shem. It means authority. Now, I don't study all the animals. I don't study all the insects, and I don't study all the birds. But there's some notable things like lambs, sheep, goats. Lions, locusts, bears, they all have an authority. And God gives man the authority over these things. He gives him the rule. That's man's boundary. That's his limit. And in Job, God gives Satan this rule. All that is his. You mean the 7,000 sheep, his children, his servants? His substance, even that hedge around Job, the blessings that God gave to Job. God gives the dominion to Satan. Let's see what he does. When you get it, uh, go ahead and read it for us. Oh, you still there, Art? Oh, my, my phone was muted. I'm sorry. I'm muted my phone. That's okay, bro. Verse 13. Mm-hmm. And it reads, mm-hmm. And the day came 
when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their brother's house, the firstborn. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses were and the Sabines fell on and took them away. And they killed the young man with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While this one was still speaking, this other also came and said, the fire of God has fallen from the heavens and has burnt up the sheep and the young man, and it has destroyed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While this one was still speaking, and the other also came and said, the Chaldees have made out three bands and swooped down on the camels, and they have taken them away, and they have killed the young men with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while this one was still speaking, the other came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in the house of their brother, the firstborn. And behold, a great wind came from the wilderness and touched the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young men, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And Job rose up and rose up and tore his robe, shaved his head. And he fell down on the ground and worshipped. And he said, I came naked out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. Jehovah gave, and Jehovah has taken away. Blessed be the name of Jehovah. And all this Job did not sin, nor charge wrong to God. Man. Now, you want to talk about, you want to talk about sovereign? This is sovereign. The Bible says the fire of God fell and burnt up, not just sheep, it burnt up the young men. I think that's what you read earlier. Hold your place. Oh, uh, give us double ring, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 39. I want to show you all something about the authority of God when it comes down to not only time, not only power and exercising his authority, but how does he exercise his authority? <laughs> Let's see. The ox were plowing. When you get it, hold it from it. And God sent Sabians along and took them away. Killed some folks. Fire God burnt up the sheep. Killed some men. Huh. The Chaldees, they come in in three bands. They take away the camels. There's your ride. Your ride is gone. That's, that's sort of like, you know, you're paying notes on your car. All of a sudden, you get three, four months behind, and all of a sudden, the repo man comes to get it while you're sleeping. Car gets repossessed. That's the will of God. And then they kill some more people. Death. You know, you notice what's in here. Death, 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 and more death. Then I'm going to take, 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 and take again. And then Joel rises up. He rents his mouth and he says, Baruch Hashem. Blessed be the authority that killed my cattle, killed my servant, took my sheep, took my camels, killed the men, killed the children. Baruch Hashem. Blessed is the authority that done all of this in my life at this time. Go ahead. When you get it, read it out. Verse 39 and Deuteronomy 32. See now that I, I am he, and there is no other God with me. I kill and I keep alive. Mm. I would and I heal, and there is no deliverer from my hand. Verse 40. I wound, I kill. Y'all hear that? So he says, here, see now, look, look, proceed, understand. Uh, this, this, this ain't something that you preach on the average Easter Sunday, is it? God says, I wound 
You ever been on a job and you scraped your hand against the wall? Got a splinter? Sprained your ankle? Some of you guys out here who play soccer and basketball, hurt your elbow, lifting weights. Eye wound. I know that's going to be hard for people to believe. See these guys out here pulling these stunts on these bikes and some of them lose their head. Some of them get paralyzed from their neck down. I wound. I heal. God heals. He's in the healing business. If he wants to. I kill. There's a lot going on in this killing, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot of killing going on here. In Job. Chapter 2 of Job, I key. I the Lord. This is why in the very last part of that, it says, in all this, Job says, God's authority is what took all these people away from me and took all my livestock, took my cattle, took my kids away from me. Blessed is the name of the Lord. The Bible says all things give thanks. Now, I don't know how you look at this, but Job was a perfect and upright man. It don't mean he didn't sin, but he didn't sin when he says, God did this. Today, you know, we like to say, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, we have a couple of, we have a couple of callers um, okay. that would like to I, chime in. But uh, we can finish up real quick, and then we can just, if you don't mind, maybe check a caller. So. Yeah, I want to take a caller. Let me finish up this last part of this. Today, right. we live in a world. I want to say this before the callers come on. We live in a world where Satan does everything. And in the last, the next, very next chapter, I'll just cover this ground. And the very last verse says, God done this to me. And he says, uh, God gives and he takes away according to John 3 and 27. Now that is sovereignty. Not the fire of Satan, but the fire of God. He was in control. Okay, let's open the lines up, Bob. All right, Sal, um, before we let the callers come on, we have no issue with people coming in and building and um, respectfully disagreeing, but make sure you keep it respectful and you keep it cordial. And like I said before, if you get out of hand, Sal will pull the plug on you quicker than the hiccup. And with that, let's go ahead, Sal. <laughs> All right, family, once again, this is the Man Up segment right here on the Bay Talk for You, Blog Talk Radio. That number to call in is 516-531-9959. Once again, the number to call in, 516-531-9959. Press number one if you have any questions for our special guest, Don Bird. It will actually uh, we'll add to the conversation. Let's open up the phone lines, 443. You're live on air, 443. Hey brothers, uh, this is Brother Mercy. Uh, I just wanted to say that you know it's a good discussion, man. It, it's a good uh, theological uh, discussion. These things you're bringing up, these points you're bringing up. Um, I just wanted to say really quickly that uh, one verse you read that in Genesis chapter one, I believe it was thirty-one, that everything he made was good. So. Um, I think if we hold to that premise, uh, when you veer away from Genesis 131, then you come up with all kind of doctrines and come up with all kind of opinions, and and then you come up with stuff. You, I mean, eventually you're going to contradict Genesis 131. You're going to eventually contradict it because you can't have it both ways. Um, and Job 122, it says, and all this Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. So he never charged him with wrongdoing. I wanted to make that clear. Um, so uh, you know, and, and so we, I mean, and and the thing about it is, even all the stuff that happened to Job, we know it was, we know it was Satan that did it, uh, because it was Satan who who did those things to Job. You know, if we're honest and tell the truth. So I, I I I just say that these these theological discussions and stuff it come up theologians argue these things all the time man I'm pretty sure you brothers know that you know there's plenty of books out on it and um, you know 
all, all those type of things. I, I, I just like to not charge God with wrongdoing because I don't believe he does anything evil or wrong. Um, and I think it can be dangerous when you venture out into that type of stuff because then you, you're attacking the character uh, of, of, of the creator. And when you do that, I mean, let's just face it. We don't understand everything. We don't understand everything. And I think we just have to be humble in our understanding and try to let the scriptures explain themselves. But, yeah, I hear these discussions, man. This is, great. this is a great discussion, man. I just wanted to say a great discussion, outstanding discussion. I love the way you guys presented it. I'm, 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 I'm just saying I'm on the side of God does, he's good, and he does things that are good. I'm on that side. I'm not on the side that he does both good and evil. I'm not on that side because, to me, that to me that's a contradiction to say he's good and evil. Because what you do is who you are, regardless of how you want to put it. What you do is who you are. So if so, if you say he does evil, then that means he is evil. You know, you can't have it say well he does evil, but he's not evil. No. So I just wanted to say, man, great discussion. This is brother Mercy. You know, that's all I wanted to say. I appreciate you, your brother thoughts, Mercy. Brother Mercy. Mercy. So, we got any other callers? All right, family. We went to the numbers 516-531-9959. We have other people listening to the show. Again, if you're on the line and you want to ask a question, simply press number one. Press number one, and we'll add you in the conversation. However, we appreciate the people listening to the program taking down your notes. If you have any comments, feel free to press number one. But uh, nobody else is uh, pressing number one at this time, but they're just listening to the show. You guys can continue. All right, I just want to ask you a question, Sal. I, I know every so often blog talk, we have our technical difficulties, and sometimes the timer is, is kind of on and off. So what, how much time do we have? Oh, we actually have uh, an hour and 13 minutes left if you want to use it. <laughs> okay. If okay, well, like Brother all. Don, mm-hmm. the, 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 Brother Don, the, the I, I would like to, uh, I would definitely like to respond to the brother, and 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 I don't mean this in no way, shape, harm, but when you when he made the statement, Brother Mercy, Aki, beloved Mercy, I really appreciate you coming in and listening to what I have to say. I want you to hear this real well. You believe that God is good. So do I. Job also believed God was good. But there's three of us who have something in common. Now, let's take that commonality to what we have read and discovered from the scriptures, okay? He says in Deuteronomy in the law, as I started out in the show, I stated in Isaiah 8 and 20, to the law and to the testimony, if, here's a conditional statement, if they speak not according to the law, according to the testimony, it is because there is blindness. There's no light. And when you don't have light, you're blindness. You're in the dark. God's word is a light, folks. It's a light. Shows you the hodos, H O D O S, or you hodos, or the well way, or the narrow road, the truth, the exactness of what God determines. God is a judge. A judge is one who rules and presides over matters, cases of law, and in legal or in legal matters. That's what Torah is. It is instruction. He tells you what's good and what's evil. If the Bible says God does evil, that's one thing. If the Bible says God forms evil, that's one thing. But if God says this is evil, (laughs) then it's evil. If he says this is good, then it's good. I'm trying to show you the dichotomy here. If God is a judge and he's sovereign, he has absolute power, absolute authority, absolute control as life's monarch or the reality 
I like to say, I just use the word sovereign, but truly, he's the monarch of all existence. Absolute, supreme monarch of all existence. Anything that be, anything that is, was, should, would, could, have, has had, he is absolutely in control of it. Meaning, the evil that's here, he created it. The good that's here, he created it. That's what Job says when he says, in the last verse, when it says, and all this, Job did not sin with his lips, nor charge. The word in the Hebrew is the word natan. Natan. I'm sorry, N-A-T-A-N, Natan. And that word means God gets the blame. God gets the blame. I said before, Job feared God. Now, you know, some people don't understand this. To fear God is to understand that he can do evil or he can do good. The verse shows us that all the good that God did, even Satan commented and said, man, he don't fear you for nothing. <laughs> Look at what all you gave him. 7,000 sheep, oxen, children, servants, land. I hedge about them. Man, you done blessed this man. I fear you too. But behold, take your hand and take it away from him, and he'll curse you to your face. That's what, that would have been evil if Job would have done that. But in all this, Job said, I give the charge to God. That's what he said. He said that God did it. Now, Genesis 1, as you stated, yeah, God is good. Everything he, everything he says is good. But our imagination will say something is good when it is evil. Because man's imagination is evil from his youth up. And that word imagination, as I stated earlier, just to go back and recap on that, folks. Man's opinion is thing. Now that's God's opinion. And in Daniel he says, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Well less than nothing. Nothing. We can't even understand nothing because all we know is something. Science will tell you this. That's our opinion to God. It is brutish. Every man in his own opinion, what we devise in our minds, and our wicked, deceitful, desperately, our wicked hearts, is evil. Yes, God created everything, and he said it was good, but he wasn't talking about man's heart. He wasn't talking about man's opinion. In fact, if we're going to take what God says at his words, then we're going to have to accept the fact that I am the Lord. I create light. I create darkness. I do good. I wound. I create evil. I the Lord, Yehovah, Y-H-V-H. That's the tetragrammaton. There's four letters. And that is always, always a reference. I, now, I believe that's Christ, but there's one God. See, and I, I'm gonna submit this to you all. Deuteronomy tells you about this, and Isaiah tells you about the light and the dark. You wouldn't know what dark was without light. It's dark in the beginning. He tells you that. He says, "Let there be light." Light don't come into existence until God says till He declares it. He's declared the end from the beginning, from the nativity. See, the whole start of this conversation was about God and his authority. It's not about what we think. That's what's so great about the, su the subject. Is it theological? Yes. It's also philosophical. It's biblical. But it goes beyond that. It takes all of the sciences and disciplines of knowledge to come to this. And I'm not saying I know it all. I'm just 
I'm just a believer, and I understand that when Christ tells Peter, Peter says, I will never deny you. But when Christ tells Peter, you're going to deny me thrice before the cock crows, question. So why did he deny him? Why didn't he? He didn't want to, but because Christ said he would. That's sovereignty. It's amazing how this works. You just have to stop and take time and ask the serious questions, the hard questions. Why? Who? What? Where? Everything that we're seeing about this is all pointing back to God. He's the reason for the season. I know it's a little cliche and euphemistic statement, but that's what we do. Why is the sun up? Why is it cold? Why is it 49 degrees right now where you live? Why is it snowing? The Bible tells you that. Here, let's look at one of those verses. I won't bother you right the second, B.A. I'll get it. <laughs> I appreciate your labor of love, though. I want to show you something from your Bible a little bit about nature. Just a little bit. Job 38, verse 22. He's having this conversation. He says, have you entered the treasures of snow? Or have you seen the treasures of hail? Hail and snow are the declarations of God. Some kind of way, he does something with the moisture in the atmosphere at a certain time at a certain temperature at a certain height, and some kind of way stuff happens like snow. I don't know. Even the fire of God. Here's what he says about lightning. Second Samuel 22, verse 15, and he sent out his arrows. He sent out his arrows and scattered them. Lightning discomfited them. This is Job 38, verse 25. Who has divided a water course? For the overflowing of waters Or A way for the lightning Of thunder Cast forth lightning Scatter them Shoot thine arrows and destroy them That's Psalms 144 and 6 And we can do this all day And all night About the nature that we see around us Even earthquakes The Bible says God uttered His voice and his anger And shook Foundations of the earth You find that in the book of Psalms Everything that's happening In nature around you Sometimes can result In calamity Calamity is raw Where you find these things For us Times we just think oh, Well you know the devil did it No the devil didn't have the kind of authority. We see that. Job, the book of Job proves that. Satan is a servant. He's an evil servant. And God formed him. I'm going to show you that, where Satan comes from. I'll show you that God is, has everything to do with why we even have a devil, Satan. This is the book of Job. See if I can pull that up right quick. Book of Job 26 at verse 13 by his spirit, by the Ruach. Spirit is Ruach from the Hebrew. By his spirit, he had garnished the heaven. His hand had formed the crooked serpent, the Nachash. Funny that Nakash, the same Nakash in Genesis 3. That's who's talking to Eve. Earlier I said I didn't submit to you who that tree of the knowledge of good and evil was. Now I'm giving it to you. That's Satan, the serpent. God ordained Satan. He ruled in the garden. You're not going to hear that from many people, but it is true nonetheless. Just because a few people say it, and the mass majority 
disagrees with it, that does not mean the mass majority is correct. That is symbolism in the Bible. Guess who the tree of life is? That is Christ. That is the Son of God. Now, no, it doesn't say Son of God, but that's who it is. It isn't the Father. It's the Son. Some people would probably say angel. Well, yeah, he is an angel. Angel is malak. It means messenger or angelos in the Greek text. Messenger. And this particular messenger is the angel of the Lord. And that tree of life is what was forbidden to Adam after he ate. When you go back to Genesis 3, you see, behold, let's put man out. Behold, he has become as one of us to no good, tov, and wrong. To my Aki who called, I appreciate you calling in because what that does is it allows me to speak on a subject that I really didn't want to dive off into, but I guess since we're here, we can't deny that God creates evil no more than we can deny that God creates good. You wouldn't know bitter without sweet. You wouldn't know hot without cold. You, you understand that? Light from dark, love from hate. This is all necessary. It is necessary to have evil. Now, I don't know why it's necessary to have evil, but I can say the same thing about good. I don't know why it's necessary. All I know is this is what God says he does. And the Bible says in Romans 8, I want to bring you to Romans 8 and 28. Let's go there. Romans 8 and 28. I want to show you another notable point. Since I'm talking on this subject By the way there's no end to talking about God's sovereignty This is Romans 8 and 28 And we know that all things work together All things God created all things In some kind of way all things work together I don't know what that means what do you mean work together? Some kind of way, whatever's happening in your life, God has ordained it to work together for agathos. In the Greek text, in the Hebrew, the word is tov, T-O-W-D, tov. And in the Greek text, the word is agathos, A-G-A-T-H-O-S, or agathos. Either way you want to pronounce it, fine by me. It works together for your good. Now, I don't know how it worked together for Job's good, but it worked together for his good. All the events in the first chapter, all the events of Adam's life, everything that happens in the third chapter of Genesis, everything that happens in Seth's life, Enoch's life, Hallelujah, Noah's life, Noah gets the grace of God, he's saved through the flood. Now, I don't know how you want to explain it, but we know that all things work together for good, not to everybody. It says them in the Greek text, in your English Bible, it says them. That love God, agape, not like, not feel like you like. No, agape is to obey. This is love that we walk after his command. I want you to build an ark from gopher wood, pitch it with pitch. He put the kafar and the kafir on the ark, kofir on the ark. He obeys God. That's how you love God. Same thing with the case of Abraham and Isaac. That's agape. It means to obey. It is a verb. It works for good, agathos, to them that love God, those who obey God, to them. Now, people don't like this too much. To them who are called. The kletos, those who God summoned. To them, not to everybody. I, I know, now that ain't gonna, that probably won't go over well. Not to everybody on the planet. No. Nope. Nope. I mean, it's 
it's just like you had three or four kids and only one of them obeys. Which one loves you? You got four kids, only one of them obeys anything you say. Which one loves you? That might be a hard question. But if you love your parents, you'll obey them. That's the point. To them who love God, to them who are called according to his purpose, to his will. That's what we read out of the book of Daniel. He doeth his will. Will is purpose. Purpose. God has a purpose. He does he is arbitrary, but he has a purpose for everything. That's what this verse is saying on top of everything else it's saying in this context. God has a purpose. He's not like us. We Sometimes we, we just do things just, oh, I just want to do it. The Most High is not like that. He determines. He has an exact calculated plan. Let's say it that way. He determines the future of a thing because he says so. He declares the end. From the beginning, that means that, and his segue into another part of this, that means that God has the ability to choose between possible outcomes, and that's the very meaning of free will. Free will is the ability to choose between two possible courses of actions. And one of those courses of action that we already declared earlier was death. It's appointed the men to die once, and after this, the judgment. Funny, the God of the Bible, he has the right, he has the authority to kill or to make a lie, to wound, to take away the sight, or to not give sight, to take away the child, the servant, the ox, Sheep, God has the ability to do all of these things because he is an absolute monarch. God is a heretic. The boundaries and the borders. But for the life of the believer, for some reason, Paul wants to tell us that uh, no matter if it's evil in your life or not, evil events are for your good. I want to touch on that a little bit. And if we do get a caller in, I would like to open the line up for a caller. Here, let me bring you to a point about the evil and the good. Verse 29, I'm still in Romans 8. Paul goes further on to tell the Romans, he says, For whom he did for no, for no, whom, not what, whom, the people, like Jacob, for example. He foreknew Jacob, Jeremiah the prophet. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Obadiah, Habakkuk, Amos, and the list goes on and on. He also did predestinate. Predestinate is the word prohorizo. The word forno is the word prognosco. And this might seem like like a lot of high scholarship and a lot of fifty five dollar words, but pro is our word pre, which is a prefix meaning before, and the word genosco. Is our word knowledge, gnosis, knowledge. Before knowledge, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Not the word predestinate, the word is prohorizo. Again, the word pro, this is a construct in the Greek of our English word pre, which is a prefix. And the word horizo, our word horizon. And what's in the horizon? Is light to be pre enlightened, to be pre bound. God has pre bound the elect that He called in verse 28, and in verse 29, He's predestinated us. He starts talking about predestination, getting into the doctrine of soteriology, of the doctrine of predestination. This is all dealing with salvation. God is sovereign even over that. I don't, now, I want to submit this to you all. I don't believe that it's something I can do to save myself. I don't believe a man can choose God. For all the verses that we already read earlier, I don't believe we can choose God. 
I believe he has to choose us. He says so in the law. He says, I have chosen you, not because you were the greatest, Israel, but because you were the fewest. And he loved the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He swore, promised to Abraham that he would multiply his seeds as if you can count the stars of heaven, so shall you see. So shall your seed be, and after the 400 years, they come out of the land of Egypt, 430 years, the Bible says. They come out of the land of Egypt, and God makes a covenant with them right there in the wilderness. They didn't choose God. God chose them before they were ever born. And some scholars say Abraham is roughly, oh, I don't know, 2000 BCE, something like that. Moses comes along. Critical Jewish dating is roughly 14, 1350 B.C. That's when Moses comes along. That's a decent gap of about seven, six, seven hundred years. And these children have been predestinated to learn and come to who God is. Now, you want to talk about sovereign? <laughs> that, folks, is sovereign. That is absolute control and authority and power over one's destiny. Your destiny and lot in life, according to Ecclesiastes, is in the hand of God. Now, I know this is going to sound a little crazy. Where a man goes in life and what a man does, according to Proverbs, he says, a man heart devises his way, but it is God that directs his step. It's not within a man to direct his own step. What does you mean direct like an orchestrator does? We know that all things work together for good to them who are called, those who love God. I mean, so God is doing all this direction. So he determines when the drum beat stops and when the drum beat keeps beating. He also determines when the heart stops and when it begins because he's declared all things from ancient times, from the beginning, these things not yet done under the sun. That's sovereign. That's really sovereign. Aki B.A. brought up the point about Pharaoh. A lot of folks argue about this subject concerning Pharaoh. One word in the Hebrew text calls that, that word harden. That word harden in Exodus 7 and 13. God made Pharaoh stubborn. It's a beautiful story, a we, a basket weave, of how God makes this man to be so stubborn. It's it's like a mosaic. One of the best words for that is the word obstinate. The word obstinate means stubborn. Refusing to change one's opinion or chosen course of action despite attempts to persuade one to do so. God has control over the mind. So far, we've covered quite a few things, folks. The mind. God can control and manipulate the mind. I won't go through all the oh, dozen or so verses concerning Pharaoh and how God harden them. I will say this, just touch on this point. When one refuses, when one refuses, or when one rejects, because I don't hear nobody really saying this, rejection is a sign of the, that meant there was a cause, and God is the cause. God calls Pharaoh to reject the signs that Moses had in his hands. So refusal and rejection are just signs that what God stated has affected them. And what's affecting them is the word of the Lord. I will harden. You know, a lot of <clears throat> folks try to get around that, but that was evil. And God fixed it to where it could happen no other way. It is a fixed course of action. 
nope, I'm going to drive drunk regardless to what good sense says. And that right there is God's direction. The law, folks, I'm going to put this on your plate. The law is instruction. Instruction is not magic. Get that out your head. It's not magic. I want to say this to my Hebrew people because sometimes these arguments, they go into something that really don't make sense. But even confusion is also part of God's will. You can call it preemptive wills, whatever kind of will theologians want to call it. But earlier I said this, God created, I want to go to one of these verses, all things, every act of nature, the stubbornness of man's mind, the state of quality of man's mind, the man's inability to think like God, the fact that God chooses man, man doesn't choose God, because the Bible says none seek after him. There's none that seeketh after God. I don't know why we don't. I guess maybe it's because our mind has an imagination, has a very wicked imagination. I'm harping a lot about man. Insurance companies, they call things like Katrina and Hugo, if you've ever been through any of these I have in my life. These, they call that acts of God. Isn't that amazing? Acts of God. Our whole salvation is based on God's will. I believe that. I'm not a big going to church camp type of person. No. But I believe that what saves us isn't what I do. It's what he does. He saved Noah. I don't know what camp Noah was a part of, but Whatever it was, I'm sure that the Savior was God, and God found some, for whatever reason, he decided to show his favor. Don't know how many people existed at the time. All I know is Noah was saved through a flood. Now, whether you believe it happened or occurred or not really is irrelevant. The point is, apparently God has, what's the word we're looking for? He has his favorite. You know, every movie we watch, most of the time we're watching it is because there's a star in it. God has stars. And in this life, God, he don't trust his stars, but he loves them enough to save them. I don't know why, but that's his choice. God is, I said I was going to look this word up arbitrary for us while we're talking about the subject. God is arbitrary. God has free will. He has the ability to determine our course of action in life. Whether you're white, black, Chinese, Puerto Rican, German, Jamaican, Asian, or whether you're an American, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're bond, whether you're in prison, somebody you know is in prison, somebody in jail, all of these things happen in our lives because that's what God declared from the beginning. Here, let's look up arbitrary. You don't hear this much from really anyone. But I think it's true. Arbitrary. I want to go to something very simple. And if we can, we'll take a call. Arbitrary. Definition. Adjective. Based on random choice or personal whim, rather than any reason or see or or system. Basically, in a nutshell, he doeth his will in the kingdom of heaven and in the kingdom of men, and none can stay his hand and say unto him, "What are you doing?" But God has a purpose for everything He does. He isn't just acting. He's not just doing. There's a purpose for it. To us, it seems like when we're kids, some of our children, and even when I was a kid, I don't want to go to bed at 8 p.m. 
But there's a reason why you need to go to bed at 8. There's a reason why you need to brush your teeth. There's a purpose for it. Sometimes children don't understand our purpose. But when you have a will as a parent, you expect to enforce it. See, even we do it. There's a purpose. There's a purpose for you being on time at your job. But if you're late, that too is part of God's will. It may not seem that way, but it is. Everything that's happening right now in our modern society is happening because there's a God that sits high and he decides who is going to make it today and who's not. That sounds radical, doesn't it? Who's going to be rich and wealthy? And who's going to be poor? He decides that. The Bible says so. Here, yeah, let's look at one of those verses before I go any further. This is the book of Samuel. Shmuel 2 at verse 7. The Lord maketh poor. The Lord maketh rich. The Lord bringeth low, and the Lord lifted up. Nebuchadnezzar was exalted, and he was brought down. He was made rich, and then he was made stupid, like a dumb animal, brutish, natural, brute, beast. Yea, he set it the poor on high from affliction. Why are we going through affliction? God causes it. That's Psalms 107 at verse 41. And he maketh him families like a flock. Man's got a big family. God gave it to him. Everything in this Bible I noticed over the years has a rhythm to it. It's not just a good read. You know, it's not just a lot of loud and long sermons. No, I believe that there's something in here it's coded about God, and I'm just scratching the surface on this conversation tonight. And I do appreciate the opportunity to do this. Yeah, and, and just one comment to the brother that came on, and I do appreciate your courage for coming on. This is not a simple, easy, digestible subject. Because we live in a very subjective world and a very tumultuous time where things just don't look fair. And this idea about God and his sovereignty, it don't seem fair. It don't seem fair at all. Because what it says is we don't have any control. We're not in control. We'll never be in control. It just doesn't seem fair. Does it? Here's the definition of fair. Mark my impartiality and honesty. Free from self interest, prejudice, or favoritism. Well, God is prejudiced. Pre Judas. God has a self-interest. Is it fair? Question. You create the house. You build it. You own it. Is it fair for you to determine who lives in it? Question. Is that fair? It might not be fair to our children, Marked by impartiality, honesty, free from self-interest, prejudice, or favoritism. But God is prejudiced. He does have a self-interest. He's self-sustaining. He's self-existing. Here, I want to show you something. Brother Don, I want to show you. Talk to me. Just to let you know, we do have another caller. Okay, bring the call in. Okay, bring sir. Bring the call right on in. 
Let's give it All a right, ring. we're going to the phone lines. We're going to the phone lines. Again, the number is 516-531-9959. Let's go to 510-510. You're live on air. Hey, uh, uh, peace, brothers. How y'all doing, man? This is uh, Vinny D. How y'all doing tonight? <laughs> What's good, on brother? <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm just listening in. You know, called in to support. Just mainly listening. Um, I kind of been off and on a little bit, but and my uh, my headset died. But uh, you know, some interesting points have been made. Definitely uh, um, uh, interesting perspective, and um, um, very uh, very unique way of delivery, which uh, keep, keep, definitely keeps you uh, interested in uh, what you got going on and the information that you're presenting. Um, I also watch uh, from time to time uh, the Source League over there, and um, you know. Uh, back when uh, Jeremiah was uh, um, with um, Jeremiah Judah when they uh, first started out going on. Uh, and I've seen a couple of your presentations, you know. I agree with a lot of uh, – I agree with a lot of things that you say, you know. I appreciate and, um, that. I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and one of the things that stuck out to me uh, before my phone cut out and then, you know, until I tapped back in was uh, – was about the demons, you know. I kind of hold a similar mm-hmm. um, perspective on the demons myself, you know. Uh, but I, I, you know, I think that you know it's more or less like ailments, you know, uh, sicknesses, and uh, mm-hmm. also sin, you know. But um, right. yeah, I definitely think you you hold a, you have a very interesting perspective, and then uh, it you know it definitely provokes uh, or it should provoke people. To want to go look look this stuff up and then uh, you know dig a little bit deeper in our studies, you know. Right. Uh, but I yeah, this right. is a powerful conversation, man. Y'all keep doing what y'all doing, and uh, you know y'all have a blessed night. You do the same, Aki. I appreciate you calling in, and sharing your thoughts, brother. Keep watching us, man. I, I appreciate that. I really do. Thank you. God bless you. Do we have any more callers? All right. Once again, the number is 516-531-9959. Uh, other people are just standing by checking out the show via phone. Again, you can press number one if you have any questions. We do have a few minutes left of the show. But once again, you can squeeze your questions in or your comments by pressing number one if you're on the phone lines. Again, the number is 516-531-9959. Put it on speed dial. <laughs> Make sure you call in. Okay, continue. This is a big subject, folks. Uh, I really would like to encourage you all to come in, call in, and you know, and, and you know, share your thoughts. I, I'm just a man. I, the more I've learned, the more I learn, the more I've learned. I don't know anything. I did not realize any of this information. I didn't know this was sitting in a Bible. I didn't know that. But the hearing ear, Proverbs 20 and 12, hear Shama, S-H-A-M-A, Shama, equivalent to our word hearken, or listen. The hearing ear, the obedient ear, to hear is to obey. To hear is to obey. That's it's a math equation. Is to, equal to, to the same degree of. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, God hath made them both. There was a man born blind in the scriptures, and the disciples asked Jesus, for sure, what sin did this man's parents commit? With, or did his parents commit a sin that caused him to be born blind? Cause. Or did the man commit a sin himself to cause? Notice they want to know the cause. We want to know the cause of why anything happens the way it happens. Funny, I don't go to that verse in my last few minutes around it off of this. 
in light of Proverbs 20 and 12. He said something real interesting, and I thought it was interesting. And this is all over the Bible. I, I just wanted to touch on this point. He says, uh, let's see, let's go to this. And this is in the Gospels. And I think most of us are familiar with this account, how Jesus, uh, he let him out of town. He spat on his eyes. He put his two hands upon him and asked him if he saw. Long story cut short is Christ answers the disciples as he healed the man. He says, this man did nothing wrong or his parents did nothing wrong. They had this belief that if you, your parents sinned, that would fall upon the children. Ezekiel clears this up when he says, I bid that you have this Proverbs, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Y'all familiar with that? No longer shall you have the same. This man didn't commit sin. It wasn't the sins of his parents that fell on him. The man was blind because God wanted to show his power. Now, you want to talk about sovereign? Again, God causes all the events that happen in, in your life and in my life and in every man's life. He's the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. And the purpose was, I caused you to be born blind so that I might show my power at a predetermined time. You, you see, you hear that? Let's go back to it. <laughs> Predetermined. Yep. How much time we got left, Margarita? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, we got about maybe 20 minutes left in the air. Okay. And let me just say this real quick, Brother Don, just the point you're going to get into. That's mm-hmm. so, I mean, that right there just says sovereignty. All over it. The Most High does whatever he wants to do, how he wants to do it. And this topic also can be a stumbling block. A lot of people right. are not ready for it. I remember when you first brought it to me. You know what I'm saying? I had to sit down and think hard about it because as a believer, we don't talk about this. This is one of the conversations that a lot of believers don't have. Because you said earlier, That's it right. seems like it's unfair. You know what I'm saying? But you can keep going. That's right. It is definitely a meaty subject. It's not, this isn't, uh, this isn't something you want to play around with. And while I, while I'm at it, here, let me cover this. When God reaches a decision about something, that's the way it is. The man, no, and <laughs> that's why I say you can go on and on with this. Here's this man born blind. Now, I'm not sure if the man has eye sockets, <laughs> I don't even know if he has eyeballs. I don't know. I call them eyeballs. Like light bulbs. I don't know if he has any of this. I just know he doesn't have the ability to see at all. Somewhere before this man is born. Again, science says the earth is trillions of years old, billions, millions, whatever. Somewhere in ancient times from the beginning. Whatever. Let's call this man Blue. Mr. Blue. He says, Mr. Blue is going to be born blind. I'm going to send my son to heal him. And they're going to raise up a fuss about it. God, I, I liken him to a movie director, a film director. He gives direction to everything that happens to all the events in the film. Definition. Having reached a decision, that's what determined is. And when something is predetermined, well, that's what I just described. That is sovereignty. If you can receive it. 
Which brings me to another point. Same issue. The man didn't ask to be blind. It wasn't nothing his parents caused for him to be blind. It's just something God had already determined for his good. If you can reach that far into the future concerning, oh, I don't know, maybe a child of yours, Two, three, four thousand years from now. And you could call them by name. That meant you knew their name in your mind somewhere. Not because you're looking down the corridor of time. No. That's not what God is doing. Time is the and I'll give in, get into that definition in just a moment. Time is the forward motions of events. If you're causing everything to happen, Two and three and four and five thousand years down the line, heck, even a week from now. Who are you? What are you? Where are you? What do you have? What do you own? How do you think? Where did you get your knowledge from? What are you made of? How did you do that? See, these are all questions that a student of God should be thinking, if you're thinking. Then you realize you don't have the answers to that. Neither do I. Time. Definition. The indefinite continued progress of existence and events in the past, present, and future regarded as a whole. Let me say it again. The indefinite continued progress. What does indefinite mean? Indefinite. Lasting for an unknown or unstated length of time. Indeterminate. Don't know when it stops. Endless. The endless progress of time continuing of existence and the events past, present, future. That's time. God causes time. He's not looking down some barrel of some binoculars and saying, let me get my binoculars out. Let me look down and see if this man, oh, there's a guy. He's going to be blind. Let me write about it. No. We're receiving something that was translated thousands of years ago from a language that most of us can't even read or understand. But I have learned that God isn't so far away from us where we can't understand it. But I do believe that God has to cause a man to seek him because none seek after God. None. That means nobody. Whatever he does, the book says, we know that whatsoever God doeth, it is forever. The word in the Hebrew is olam. I will go to that verse and point it out. Sometimes I, I don't I don't think people would run around citing book, chapter, and verse for every little thing, but I think it's necessary when we're dealing with this. Because if you ever get into the subject, you'll find out that it's uh, a big subject. It covers your whole Bible. Let's see if I can find this. Ecclesiastes 3, 14, I know that. Here's what the preachers are saying. I know that. I know this. I don't know much, but I know this much. If God sets the sun in the sky, it is forever. Whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it. Nothing can be put to it, he says, nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it that men should Fear before him. Well, I don't think God will do put me in heaven forever and I'll live forever. Is that a good thing? Of course, the Bible don't say you die and go to heaven. Well, it's just for the sake of the conversation. Do you think that God will put you in heaven where you can live forever? Do you believe that? I do. And that's good to them. What is equally is true. And the other side of the equation is there's a hell forever. 
See, the false dichotomy says no, only God does good. The subjective argument is God doesn't do wrong. He doesn't do evil. I have to say this. No matter what we think, if he does anything, it's not us doing it. Because what we do don't last. Everything God does lasts olam. That word olam in the Hebrew means the following. To the vanishing point, point where you can't no, where you can't no longer see. Generation to generation, faith is from generation to generation. God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. We read that in Daniel. It is also from generation to generation. On a side note, by the way, I believe that the kingdom of heaven is here now. It has always been here forever. It will be here forever. It's not something to come. It is something that will that has been in the past, present, in our modern present, and in the future. And if his kingdom, Vasileia in the Greek, his royal authority was from the beginning, from ancient times, and he's from ancient times. That means nothing can be put to it. It can't be erased or eradicated, even if people don't believe anymore in a God. Whatever hung the sun will be here. I don't know what it takes to make a sun in the sky. But whatever made it, you can just rest assured that it, he, or it, or whatever you call it, or whatever you call him, will be here forever. And we'll be gone, and he'll still be. He still exists. He is the Ahaya, Asher Ahaya, self-sustaining, self-existing. I think he has the right to do what he wants. Whenever he wants, however he wants, he's sovereign. And I believe that's why Job feared him, because they understood something in the ancient world that many of us today are totally oblivious to. Our opinions is our God. That's what Eve gave to Adam. That's what Satan sold to Eve. You can be the judge of what's good and what's not. And the issue is, yes, you can determine what you think is good for you, but you can't predetermine it, not until it's presented to you. The only choice that man has is the choice that man is given. And I, we started out talking about Adam and Eve, just to go back to it, really never got off it. Because all we are is just Adam and Eve. That's it. We're just human. <laughs> And what was put in that garden, God chose what you would eat. He chose what would happen to you in the end. You shall die in the day, 930 years. Adam lived, and the breath that God put in him separated from his body. That's death. Muth thanatos. Separation. Death means separation, not annihilation. That's man's choice. Your choice is what's given to you. We don't make choices. Choices are made by God. We say it's your choice. Yeah, because it belongs to you, that shows possession. What it does not denote is creation. You don't create choices. They're created for you and given to you, and that's how they land in your possession. I'm learning to get away from talking like that. It's your choice. You choose. You got the right to choose the choice to choose the choice. I notice on television and radio, that word gets slung around a lot. But choice is up to God to make. Choice is what God creates. Choose is what God gives. You do nothing. He does everything. All of these 
free will, arguments, determinism, all of this stuff is really a, just a picturesque of what God is doing rather than how man makes it to be. Definition helps a lot. And it has helped me come to the conclusions that I've come to. And again, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't really know. That's where I'm at. So, we can take some callers if there's any. I'm, I'm open to taking comments. If there be any. You got any questions, comments, observations to the phone line? Yeah, we only have people that are standing by listening to the show. Nobody pressed number one at this time, but we do only have a few minutes left on the air. So, uh, once again, we appreciate the family out there that's been tuning in. The show is archived, by the way. The show is archived. So, if you miss any part of the show, you can always go back and check it out. I'll go to the website, www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash debate talk for you. Also, subscribe to the YouTube channel where we post all debate talk for you content on there. We also have other segments on the YouTube channel, so make sure you go subscribe. Uh, the co-host on separate shows from the Block Talk Show on the YouTube page. So once again, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. But again, we appreciate my special guests. Give them some last words to uh, sign us out. And uh, again, be anything else you want to put out there before we uh, sign off? Okay. Yeah, brother uh, Don, you can say uh, say last few words, and I'll close it out, brother. But again, uh, thank you for coming out and the Man Up segment. Also, as a home for you, whenever you want to come back, you know, we we stay in contact. And let me know, and we can bring out more information. This is what it's all about. All right, I really want to. I, I really thank you, Brother Sal and Brother B A, for even giving Paul Rizzo an opportunity to come on the floor. Uh, this is a big, big, big step for me. And to the listening audience, I appreciate y'all taking the time to come out. Shout out to the Source Debate League. I appreciate these brothers. They they put a lot of hard effort in. I'm sure they're out there listening. Um, and I want to wish the Debate Talk for You Radio much success in the future. And any way I can support, uh, I'm more than willing to do that. And to the folks in the audience, as I always say, may the most high keep you in the well way. I hope you take something away from this message about God's sovereignty to heart and really consider these things for you and your life. I have found great peace in the many uh, hard times with this, uh, just understanding that, you know, God is in control. Everything that's happening has to happen. It is God's will, whether it be good or evil. It is for your good, Romans 8 and 28. And with that, folks, may the most I keep you, I'm off the mic. All right, stand by, fellas, stand by. Uh, somebody press number one. <laughs> we do have only a few minutes left, so I'm going to go take this caller real quick. Uh, 706, you're live. 706, you're live. Yo, yo, what up, Sal? It's your Hey, your what's going on, family? Chilla, chilla, your boy's back. I told you your boy's back. Y'all better be ready. Your hook and I are ready to come back on debate, talk to you, and either do a lesson or have a debate. What's up, Brother Don? I know you're from the Source League. Uh, good show. Good uh, presentation tonight. Shalom, shalom. I, what up? I appreciate you. But not much. How good. you doing tonight, brother? Oh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm doing real good. Awesome. Good to be awesome. back home. Good to be back home. This is where What's I started. Up? This is where I started at. Wow. Yeah, that's what I started there. You going to cool, bring us a lesson, DA? brother? Yeah, oh, what's yeah, going yeah, on, y'all? Definitely. What's going on? Ah, chilling, 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 our key. Oh, yeah, most definitely, man. Salad. I'm getting salad, any, anything. If the audience got a particular thing, a subject they want, or one that I got knowledge of, yes, I will bring the info. Awesome. That's what's up. I can't wait to... Here you get on the line, bro. I mean, this is the first night we just kind of christened the, the the opening show for the year this season. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing something from you, brother. All right, then. I all right, y'all. I just wanted. To, all right, y'all. I just wanted to make my announcement. Hey, y'all, be good. Good show tonight. Shalom. All right, Shalom, y'all. Be you be easy, brother. All right, we appreciate your call. By the way, family, quick plug. Next week, I do have a show lined up, The Hot Seat. 
you know, the hot seat is where anybody could call in. We have we invite a special guest to come on the show, and anybody could call in, of course, and ask their questions. And that special guest is Cherry Love. <laughs> Cherry oh. Love. <laughs> That's right, the hot seat. So make sure you call in. Any questions? We still got to figure out a day of the week, though, it's going to go on, but it's scheduled for next week. So you're going to have to keep up with the website, check it out, keep up with us, keep up with us on Facebook so we can figure out the official day of the week, but it's going down next week, the hot seat. If you want to speak to Sherry Love, if you have any questions for Sherry Love, she's going to be here in the hot seat segment live on the Big Talk for you. That'd be it. Mm. That's go that's gonna be very interesting. <laughs> and um I thank everybody for coming out. Um for all praises to the most high God for allowing us all to be here and for putting on Brother Parizo, Brother Don Burr's heart to come out and share his information. And this will not be the last time you will hear from the elder. Um most high willing will continue to build and bring more stuff out. With that being said, debate talk for you. Appreciate everyone. We out for the night. Take it away, Sal. Help keep the show on the air. If you want to help, you can send your donation through PayPal. The email is debatetalkforyou at gmail.com or through Cash App, dollar sign Sal Showtime. Thanks for your support. <laughs>